In the first part of this lecture, we have seen how Edward Lawrence, with the help of Margaret Hamilton and Ellen Fetter, had discovered extreme sensitivity to initial conditions, or in more colloquial language, the butterfly effect. Now, this beautiful effect essentially says that very small changes in initial conditions can lead to huge changes in long term behavior. And it essentially changed the way, or should have changed the way in which physicists view the world. Now, the person who made Lorenz's work more familiar to general audiences is somebody called James York. We have met him briefly in the last lecture. And along with his friend Smale, what York did was popularize the term chaos among a general audience. In particular, write the famous paper, Period 3 Implies Chaos where he introduced the word chaos for the first time in a scientific context. There he actually had found out a, a result which had already been discovered in a more general way in Soviet Union a few years before. And this was Sharkovsky's famous theorem. Let me also take this opportunity to express sorrow at the fact the Sharkovsky passed away just a few days before this lecture was originally given. We have also seen how York managed to train a lot of other scientists into this field by writing a very influential textbook. But what we are going to focus on today is primarily the exploits of a biologist who was introduced to the field of chaos by York himself. He was working primarily on moth populations. And this particular biologist was actually somebody who was inducted into biology rather accidentally. This was Robert May. And what he did was study mathematics and theoretical physics at Sydney University. He did his PhD in physics on the topic of superconductivity and held a postdoctoral position in the Division of Engineering and Applied Physics at Harvard University. It was at Harvard that he got interested in biology, in where he started interacting with people in the biology department. There was a lot of excitement about the new subject of population dynamics at the time, and B was sort of caught up in this enthusiasm. And he was fascinated by the wide variety of possibilities here. In fact, among some of the things that he studied were moth populations. And he saw that the population of moths kept on changing from year to year. But depending on the species, there was a wide variety of different features possible. For example, the population of Chylosuppressalis, the Asiatic rice borer, fluctuates modestly around a constant mean value, as you can see from this graph. On the other hand, that of Dendrolimus pinei, the pine tree lappet. The population is really rather low, near zero, most of the time, but it's interspersed with erratic outbreaks of a huge surge in population followed by a dramatic collapse. A third mark population that he studied was that of Zairifera diniana, commonly known as the Douglas fir cone moth, and here, the population exhibits cyclic oscillations. It goes up and down in a regular periodic manner. May was fascinated by this. So were a lot of other scientists at that time. However, most of the thinking at that time was such hugely complicated variety of behavior could only be due to entirely different reasons. And the underlying dynamics here must be very, very complicated. However, Lorenz's work and the work of Smale and York convinced me that it's possible to have such complicated behavior coming out of simple dynamics. And that is what he proceeded to show. What May tried to do was he tried to explain these complex patterns by exploring simple mathematical models. In particular, one kind of mathematical model that he was looking at are called iteration maps. The basic idea here is Pn is a population at the 
beginning of the nth year, then Pn plus 1, the population in the next year's beginning, will be some function g of Pn. Now, once again, these maps were actually tried before, but what most scientists thought was that in order to be able to explain the wide variety of different behavior that's seen, you would need a different function g for different species. And not only that, these functions should all be very complicated so that it, they can actually show such behavior. Now, whatever be the case, these maps would lead to a sequence of populations. You start with the population P0, apply the map G on it, you get P1, the population at the beginning of the first year, then population P2, then P3, then P4, and so on. It turns out that these sequence of populations end up having very interesting properties. And that happens not only for complicated maps G, but also for very, very simple maps. In most of the rest of this lecture, we are going to actually look at the long-term behavior of these sequences of numbers that you get by applying a given map G repeatedly on a starting value. Now, it will be very useful if we had a way of exploring this graphically. And there happens to be such a method which works when you have a map involving one variable. Let me try to explain what that method is. You start essentially by drawing the graph. Setting up the axis, then drawing the graph of the function y equals gx. I've just chosen a parabola here because that's what you're going to see for most of the rest of this lecture. And in addition to this graph of y equal to g of x, you also draw another graph, a much simpler one, that of y equal to x. So this red line is a line which makes an angle of 45 degrees with the x-axis. Of course, in your picture, it may not look like the angle is 45 degrees. That, that's because we are using a different scale on the y and the x-axis here. Now, we start with your initial point x0, where you are going to start the iteration. So x0 will give rise to x1, then x2, and then x3, and so on. So we start with a point x0, comma 0, a point on the x-axis with, with its coordinate given by x0. Now, if you go vertically up until you hit the blue curve, what you have got is a point whose x-coordinate is x0, and the y-coordinate is, of course, g of x0, that is x1. So we have x0, x1 here. Now, if you start from this point and start proceeding horizontally until you hit the y equal to x line, at that point, of course, the y coordinate stays the same, that is, stays at x1, and the x coordinate becomes the same as x0, as x1. Remember, that's a y equal to x line. So, the point x1, 0, which would start off the next stage of the iteration, can be obtained by dropping down vertically from this point. So, if you go all the way down here, you hit x1, 0. Of course, after that, you will have to go up vertically again until you hit the curve to get the point x1, x2, x1, g of x1. Now, you must have realized that the last two steps are redundant. Instead of going all the way down here and then going up again, you could have just come down or move vertically from this point x1, x1 until you hit the curve. So, in the rest of the steps, you just forget about going all the way down. You just go down or up until you hit the curve. And then keep on repeating this. Go horizontally until you hit the y equal to x line, then vertically until you hit the curve. So, that's one pair of steps. That gives you x2, x3 here. Then one more, that will give you x3, x4, and so on. You can see the long-term behavior just by keeping on repeating this over and over again. Now, diagrams of this kind, especially when the iteration provides some complicated pattern, tend to remind people of the intricate webs the spiders spin. So, these are often called cobweb diagrams. These, after all, are the best tools if you have a single variable map for visualizing what will happen if you keep on applying a map repeatedly. Let us try to gain some understanding of this procedure 
by applying it to a very very simple situation. A situation where the map G is a simple map, a linear one. G of x is alpha times x plus beta, where alpha and beta are two constants. Now, one very important point in the context of iteration maps is the so-called fixed point. It's a point which if you were to start with, you would not move from. That is, if you were to give the value x star to this map g of x, you will get back x star. So once you are at the fixed point, you are not going to change at all. That's why it's called fixed. In this particular case, the fixed point is very easy to figure out. The fixed point is just a point which satisfies x star equals g of x star. And in this particular case, you can easily solve this to get beta by 1 minus alpha to be the value of x star. Graphically, it simply means that if you draw the graph of g of x, which is alpha x plus beta here, and the y equal to x curve, just the way we would have drawn our cobweb diagrams, the point where they intersect is the point where whatever you give is the value you get back from the iteration, and therefore, this is your fixed point. Of course, because here, we have a single straight line intersecting the y equal to x line. There will be only one such point. For more complicated functions, there will be multiple such points. Now, it is true that the point x star is fixed. That means if you start at x star, you will stay at x star. But what happens when you don't start exactly at that point, but start somewhere close to it? Let's see. If the slope of the straight line, alpha x plus beta, happens to be less than 1 and positive, that is, you have an upward sloping straight line which is not as steep as the red line here, you can easily see that starting off from this point, you go vertically, then horizontally, vert vertically, horizontally, vertically, and so on. Remember, you go vertically until you hit the curve. In this case, the curve is a blue straight line. Then you go horizontal until you meet the red line, the y equal to x line, then vertically again horizontally and so on, you can easily see that you are going to get closer and closer to the point x star. So, even if you start away from there, you are going to get there. In fact, that will happen even if you start from a value which is smaller than x star. Vertical motion until you hit the blue curve, then red curve, then blue, then red and so on, you are going towards x star. So, this is a situation where even if you don't start at the point x star, you tend to approach it as you keep on increasing your number of iterations. Under such a condition, the fixed point is called stable if at least points where you start close to it tend to converge towards it. On the other hand, if the straight line happened to be steeper than the y equal to x line, that is, it had a slope alpha which is more than 1, you can see that even if you start very close to the fixed point, you are actually going to go further and further away. And that happens even if you start it on the other side. You start very close, but then you go further and further away. So, alpha positive leads to an unstable fixed point. What about when alpha is negative? It's pretty easy to see that if Alpha is negative, that is, it's downward sloping. The straight line is downward sloping, but has a slope which is less than 45 degrees or less than minus 1 in magnitude. What you are going to see is a curve, a cobweb diagram which keeps on spiraling in towards the point x star. In fact, this is the kind of diagram which actually justifies the name cobweb diagram. On the other hand, if this curve was even steeper, steeper in the negative direction that is, that a slope which was less than minus 1, then even if you were to start very close to it, the sequence of horizontal and vertical lines would take you further and further away. So, you will get an unstable fixed point. So, wrapping it all together, for this particular situation, the fixed point x star beta by 1 minus alpha of this particular iteration, xn plus 1 coming out of g of xn, that is alpha xn plus beta, happens to be unstable if mod alpha is more than 1 and stable for mod alpha less than 1. 
So the magnitude of alpha which matters here. And although we had justified this just by looking at the diagrams, there's a very easy algebraic way to understand it. Just take a look at what happens on successive iterations. The to the gap between the iterates, the xn's, and the x star, the fixed point. At the end of one iteration, xn becomes xn plus 1. The gap from the fixed point, mod of xn plus 1 minus x star, is simply the same as alpha xn plus beta, that of course is xn plus 1, minus alpha x star plus beta's magnitude. Remember, x star is a fixed point, so it's the same as alpha x star plus beta. So what does this give you? It gives you a simple mathematical result that the gap between an iterate and the fixed point, this is the gap earlier, this is the gap after the iteration, is multiplied by the factor mod alpha. Of course, this means that if alpha is a number whose magnitude is less than 1, this gap is going to get smaller and smaller. You are multiplying by a number which is smaller than 1 in size, so the gap shrinks. And you have a fixed, stable fixed point, in this case. If mod alpha is more than 1, of course the gap keeps on increasing and you have an unstable fixed point. Now, this is exactly true, no matter where you start from, as far as this linear map is concerned. But a more interesting case will be when g of x is some other function. But if you are close enough to a fixed point, the curve will essentially look like a straight line. So it will look like a tangent. So, as long as you're talking about what happens to points very close to a fixed point, the same argument actually works. Is the quantity alpha, the slope of the straight line, in this case the slope of the tangent, which dictates whether the fixed point is stable or unstable. The general condition for stability for a general function would then be, take the derivative of the function g, which you should remember from class 12 calculus, is the slope of the tangent at that point. Evaluate g prime at x star, giving you the slope of the tangent at that point. And then if the magnitude of this is less than 1, then you have a stable fixed point. If it's more than 1, you have an unstable fixed point. If the value is exactly equal to 1, then things become a bit crazy. For our linear case, what will happen is that no matter where you start, you are going to go round and round and round the fixed point. but keep on repeating the same thing over and over again. But my behavior may be more complicated than this if g prime x star's magnitude is exactly equal to 1. We are not going to worry about that one special case for the rest of the lecture. But this is one thing you have to remember. If the magnitude of the derivative at the fixed point is less than 1, then you have a stable fixed point. And if it's more than 1, then the fixed point is unstable. With this background under our belt, let us go back to May and take a look at the population model that he was trying to investigate. Now the simplest population model that you can have is simply that population doesn't change. Whatever the population is currently, that pulses to the next year. However, that would be rather unrealistic. So a more realistic situation would take into account the fact that Population changes because of births and deaths. Now, I am saying more realistic instead of the only realistic model here because there could also be population changes because of migrations in or out of the system. But that is something we are not really going to worry about right now. Now, the simplest possibility that you can have here is that the rate at which births take place, that is, number of births divided by the total population, and the death rate are both constants. Anyway, if you just use the ratios of births to current population as a birth rate and death to current population as a death rate, then you can obviously write this formula down. What makes the problem really very simple as a mathematical problem, although not necessarily very realistic as we will soon see, is that we can assume, for simplicity at least, that birth rate and death rate are both constants. So, the next year's population is going to be 1 plus a constant times the current population. If we call this constant 1 plus the growth rate as lambda, the 
next year's population is going to be lambda times the current population. Or in terms of an equation, we will have p n plus 1, population at the beginning of the n plus 1th year, is lambda times p n, where lambda is a constant. Now, it's obvious that if lambda is more than 1, the population grows exponentially, and if it's less than 1, the population dwindles off, reaching 0 in the long run. This model, while very simple, does not really mimic real life very well. In real life, population does not really grow exponentially. It usually steadies out. In some cases, we also have cycles of population, as in the case of the Douglas fir cone moth that we saw a while earlier. Now, one of the reasons why this happens is that the death rate would tend to grow with population sizes. After all, we have limited amount of resources for a population and increasing population would put a strain on that, causing more and more of the population to die out. Now, the simplest way you could model for this, I'm not claiming this is a very realistic way, but the simplest possible model for this would be the growth rate, instead of being a constant g, is g or b, as I've written here, is b minus mu times pn. So the larger the population, the growth rate goes down. Of course, if the population is very, very small, then the growth rate is nearly b, so that at least for small populations, the pn plus 1 equal to lambda pn formula more or less works, but once the population becomes larger, the growth rate tends to die down. Now, with this particular model, the formula that we have for next year's population is the following. pn plus 1, the population at the beginning of the n plus 1th year, is simply 1 plus the growth rate, b minus mu pn, times pn. If we call 1 plus b lambda, as we did before, what we end up with is this formula, pn plus 1 is lambda times pn minus mu times pn squared. Now, it's easy to see that if this were the correct equation, that the population would be bounded above by a number p0, which is given by lambda over mu. If the population is p0 at a given stage, next year's population would end up becoming 0. Now, in terms of the ratio pn over p0, which we call xn, the interesting part of the dynamics will be when this xn is bounded between 0 and 1, and in terms of xn, the equation can be rewritten simply by dividing both sides of this equation, pn plus 1 equals lambda pn minus mu pn square, by pn and taking lambda common out from the right hand side. So this is what you are going to get, pn plus 1 over p0 is of course lambda times pn over p0 minus mu times pn square over p0, I have just taken lambda common out of the right hand side. But notice that this mu by lambda is nothing but 1 over p0, so this thing in the bracket here is just pn by p0 minus pn square by p0 square. Or in terms of the fractions, what we have is xn plus 1 is a function of xn and that function is given by lambda times xn minus xn square or in other words lambda times xn times 1 minus xn. So this is the particular map that is going to occupy a large part of our time in what is to come, the famous logistic map which Robert May popularized. The logistic map was not devised by May. However, it was May's use of this to describe population dynamics and the consequences that made this map a very, very important and well-known thing in chaos circles. This is a good time to point out that if we want to keep our iterates xn's within the valid interval of 0 to 1, we must impose a bound on the value of the parameter lambda. Note that the product x times 1 minus x 
rejects is maximum when the factors x and 1 minus x are both equal, which means when x is equal to half. And then g of xn becomes g of half, that is lambda by 4. You want this to stay within 0 to 1? What you need to do is ensure that lambda is of course more than 0, but less than 4, or at best equal to 4. Now to understand the behavior of the iterations induced by this map, let us first take a look at the fixed points. The fixed points are very simple. You just have to solve the equation x star equal to g of x star, that is x star equals lambda x star into 1 minus x star. Now one solution is obvious, which is simply x star equals 0. And if x star is not 0, you can cancel by the x on both sides of the equation, and the solution now becomes obvious. The other solution for the fixed point is 1 minus 1 by lambda. So in general, the logistic map has two fixed points, 0 and 1 minus 1 by lambda. But are these fixed points stable? To see this, we have to look at the derivative of g. Now, simple class 12 calculus will tell you g prime x is lambda into 1 minus 2x. And if you now substitute for x the values of the fixed points, we get the following. g prime at 0, one of the fixed points, is given by lambda. And g prime at the other fixed point, 1 minus 1 by lambda, after a bit of algebra, turns out to be simply 2 minus lambda. So it's rather obvious that when lambda is less than 1, it is this particular derivative, which is less than 1 in magnitude. And so x equal to 0, the fixed point, is going to be the stable one. Let us now check whether the cobweb diagram for lambda equal to 0 0.9 bears this out. So we first begin by plotting g of x, which is 0 0.9 into x into 1 minus x, and the y equal to x line together, and then start at some random point within the interval 0 to 1, that is between this point and this point, and see what happens to the iterates by using the horizontal vertical trick. So we go vertical to the blue line, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, and so on. And you can easily see that you are actually going towards the x equal to 0 fixed point, which is here. Now, let us go back to the derivatives to see what will happen when lambda is more than 1. Now, notice that when lambda is more than 1, g prime 0 has a magnitude which is, of course, more than 1. And that means 0, the fixed point which was stable until now, now becomes unstable. And the fixed point actually becomes 1 minus 1 by lambda. Because the 2 minus lambda, this particular derivative, falls below 1 in magnitude. So to see what happens here, let's take a look at a cobweb diagram once again, this time for lambda equal to 2.5. So here, of course, the parabolic graph for lambda into x into 1 minus x is steeper because lambda is larger now. And now you can see that you have two fixed points within our interval of interest, within 0 and 1. 0 is, of course, still a fixed point, but you now have another fixed point with the value 1 minus 1 by lambda. Now you can also see that the graph is steeper than the y equal to x line here. Here the graph is going down, but it's not going down so sharply as to make the slope bigger than minus 1. So this fixed point is expected to be stable. Going back to our equation, g prime at 1 minus 1 by lambda is given by 2 minus lambda. 2 minus 2.5 is negative, minus 0.5, it is downward sloping, but it is not steeper than the 45 degree line. As a result, as we have said, this fixed point is expected to be stable, and let's see how the cobweb diagram bears it out. We start at this point, chosen randomly, somewhere in the interval, then go vertically up, then horizontally, vertically, horizontally, vertically, again, again, again. Now notice that this time we are actually spiraling in 
towards the fixed point. We are spiraling because the slope at the fixed point is negative and we are closing in because it has a magnitude which is less than 1. And after a few iterations, we are almost exactly at the fixed point. Strictly speaking, we will need to take infinitely many steps before we can actually hit up on the fixed point. But after a large number of iterations, we are practically sitting at the fixed point. Now let us try to understand what is going on here by using something called the bifurcation diagram. Strictly speaking, what you are seeing on your screen right now is not really a bifurcation diagram because there is no bifurcation here so far. Let me just explain to you what we have done in this case. As you have seen in the previous examples, you don't go and hit the fixed point right immediately. The iterates wander around a bit and ultimately settle down to the fixed point. What is depicted in this diagram is the following. I have chosen a particular value of lambda first. Then for that particular value of lambda, I have run the iteration several times. Maybe a few hundred times. After that, I have run the iteration a further, say, hundred times. And plotted lambdas along the x-axis and the value which the iteration returns along the y-axis on each one of these hundred subsequent iterations. In other words, every point that you see here for a given value of lambda is actually not one point but one hundred points. Why does it look like one point? Simple. It's because all of these hundred values for the x are one and the same. We have already reached a fixed point. Of course, to produce this figure, what we have done is we have kept on changing the value of lambda and plotted the graph. Now, it's easy to see that as long as lambda is less than 1, because of the initial maybe thousand iterations that I have run and thrown away, the value of x has settled down at the fixed point which is stable for lambda less than 1, namely x equal to 0. So, for all values of lambda less than 1, the graph shows a flat horizontal line, flat at 0. Once lambda equal to 1 has been crossed, the curve rises up. And that is basically because the x equal to 0 straight line, which is now denoted by this black dotted line on your graph, is no longer the stable fixed point. It is the other fixed point, 1 minus 1 by lambda, that has become stable. So it's easy to see what the equation of the curve piece which stretches from 1 onwards is. That graph is nothing but the graph of 1 minus 1 by lambda plotted against lambda. But as you must have noticed, the values of lambda in this graph do not go all the way up. It goes only up to lambda equals 3 or just short of that. And there is a reason for that. Let us now come to that reason by going back to the derivatives at the fixed points. Notice that once lambda crosses the value of 3, then this derivative has a magnitude which is more than 1, which was the case for the derivative at 0 already. It's now the case also for the derivative at the other fixed point. In other words, once lambda exceeds 3, both the fixed points become unstable. So it is impossible now to, for the system to reach any one of the fixed points in the long run. Of course, if you were to start at a fixed point, you will stay there forever. But if you start anywhere else, the iterations will not take you to either 0 or 1 minus 1 by lambda. To understand what will happen in such a case, let us examine the second iterate function. What happens when you apply g twice? We are calling this g2 of x is really g of g of x. And to see what is going to happen here, let us take a look at a graph of g2x for different values of lambda. First, for lambda equal to 2.5. Here, the blue curve is our familiar y equal to g of x. Lambda into x into 1 minus x curve. The black line here, there has been a change of color. 
because I want to use red for g of g of x. The black line here is y equal to x. And, of course, where the black line intersects the blue line gives you the fixed points, where x and g of x are the same. Of course, there are familiar old values 0 and 1 minus 1 by lambda. Notice that the red curve, the curve for g of g of x, also goes through the same two points. In other words, these points are also fixed points for g of g of x. And that's obvious. If applying g once did not move the point, applying it twice definitely will not move it. So any fixed point of g of x has to be a fixed point of g of g of x. Notice that for lambda equals 2.5, a value which is less than 3, and a value for which the fixed point at 1 minus 1 by lambda is actually a stable fixed point, there are no other fixed points of G2x. G2x only has these two fixed points within the interval 0 to 1. But things change drastically when we use a value of lambda which is more than 3. So this is the same plot for lambda equals 3.2. Of course, the g of x curve is a bit higher because lambda is a larger value now. But what is more important for us is that the depth in the middle of g of g of x has come down further and now you have two more points where g of g of x intersects the y equal to x line. In other words, the fixed points that you had for g of x are also, again trivially, fixed points of g of g of x. But now you have two more fixed points for g2x, which are not fixed points of g of x. So applying g once to this point will not keep it fixed. But applying it twice will give you the same value back. In other words, what you have is a period 2 cycle. In fact, both of these points are actually the two elements of a period 2 cycle. Apply g here, you go here. Apply g again, you go back here. So what we now expect is that this single curve that we had in the bifurcation diagram, the 1 minus 1 by lambda versus lambda curve, will split into two. But before we see that, let's check out using a cobweb diagram what really happens for a lambda, which is more than 3, in this case 3.2. So once again, we draw g of x, we draw y equal to x, and start at some random point and see what's going to happen. Notice that you're not going close to the fixed point, but what is happening is that the iterates are bouncing between this point and this point successively. So we really do have a period to cycle here. And the effect of this on the bifurcation diagram can be seen here. Now we have drawn the diagram beyond lambda equal to 3 and you actually begin to see the diagram begin to deserve its name. This is where the curve splits into two. A bifurcation has occurred. Notice what this means is, once again, for this particular value of lambda say, I run the iterate maybe thousand times in order to throw away initial fluctuations. And then plotted the next 100 or 200 points for the same value of lambda. But instead of getting one single point as we were getting before, that is all these 100 points falling on the same value, now you have two different values for the same value of lambda. And that is a sure short sign that for a given value of lambda, you are not reaching a fixed point. You are actually cycling between two different values. Of course, these values separate out from each other as lambda increases. Let me point out that this graph is still not something we have drawn all the way up to 4, the maximum value of lambda, because this is just the first bifurcation. More is on the way. In fact, this period 2 cycle is stable up to a value of lambda, which you can calculate using simple algebra and calculus. That is, you take g of g of x, find its derivative, and find out the value at which this derivative exceeds 1 in magnitude, and this lambda turns out to be around 
1 plus square root of 6 if you want an analytical expression. So what happens at lambda equals 3.45? The period 2 cycle is no longer stable. What is stable actually? The period 4 cycle. So the system undergoes a further bifurcation. But it doesn't stop here. The bifurcation cascade continues. At a slightly larger value of lambda, you get a period 8 cycle, then a period 16 cycle, then a period 32 cycle. And in fact, you keep on getting every power of 2 as periods of cycles. And these cycles have stability regions which shrink drastically as you keep on going up. In fact, this period doubling bifurcation continues until chaos develops. And this is what the full bifurcation diagram for the logistic map actually looks like. I've dropped the part near lambda equals 0. I've just started at 2.8. The first bifurcation occurs at 3, then around 3.45 as you say. Then you can see evidence of period 4 cycle. If you have very keen eyesight, you will be able to see a period 8 cycle. The 16, 32, 64, these cycles occur so close to each other that you can't really see them. But what you see here is evidence of chaos. No cyclic behavior whatsoever. But let me also point out, even within the chaotic region, you do have evidence of particular values of lambda where you have some stable cycles. For example, here you can see the famous period 3 cycle. Three values of x which cycle among each other. Now to see what this looks like as far as iterates are concerned, let us go back to cobweb diagrams. Let us begin in a region where full-blown chaos had not started yet. Let's say at around lambda equal 3.5, where the bifurcation diagram tells us that we are going to get a period 4 cycle. Each value of lambda corresponds to four different values of x which you are going to get as the cycle progresses. Let's see that on a cobweb diagram now. As always, we have plotted the g of x and the y equal to x line, now started at a random point, use the vertical horizontal rule to keep on getting successive iterates. It seems like you are getting close to the fixed point, but actually you are not. And you are beginning to cycle around. But notice that by now things have settled down and you have gone into a period 4 cycle. Here, this goes here, this goes back here, this goes back here, as you can see. So you can see that after the first few steps, the thing is going to cycle between these four values and you do have a period for cycle, as the bifurcation diagram was telling us. Now going back to the bifurcation diagram again, let us take a look at this region where you have chaotic behavior. What do the iterates look like? In such a case. So we are using a value of lambda equals 3.82 that has been chosen to be just before the period 3 window has opened up. And you are still in the chaotic region. This jump that you see here is basically because we have dropped the first few thousand points and then we are going on from here. And notice what's happening. As you keep on going through iteration after iteration, sometimes it looks like the point is settling down close to the fixed point or some cycle, but it actually is never doing anything of this sort. You are keeping on getting more and more different values of x, but you are not getting x all over the place. Remember, this is chaotic, but not full-blown chaos yet. The whole interval is not covered. You notice that you were very close to the fixed point a while ago. As a result, for successive iterates, the blue point, the blue dot hardly moved. But now, it has started moving away all over again and started going all over the place. Now, let us next go on to look at the period 3 cycle, which will occur somewhere around this region. So. 
for lambda equal 3.833, which is within the period 3 cycles window, what you are going to get is something like this. In the beginning, you see that the points seem to go all over the place, but very soon, they will actually settle down to a period 3 cycle. You are beginning to see the cycle emerge now. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. This point goes here. This, this point goes here. Then this point goes here. Then this point goes back here. Let us now take a look at what full-blown chaos looks like. This happens for the maximal value for lambda, that is lambda equal to 4. This, of course, has a very steep or high parabola. And here's the y equal to x line. And now, let's take a look at what happens to a random point under successive iterations. Notice the point keeps on migrating all over the place. And here, it literally goes all over the place. That is, from very small values of x to huge values of x. Huge in the sense, values very close to 1. Indeed, if you were to go on long enough, the iterates will visit arbitrarily close to every value of x in the interval between 0 to 1. And successive iterations apparently have no correlation whatsoever. This is chaos in its full glory. 